you have your Bibles, please turn with me to the book of Numbers. To the book of Numbers. And as you're turning there, um, I have one quick thought for you. Uh, if I can give the title of this of the uh, sermon I have for tonight, <clears throat> we'll go around this thought right here. Are you a rebel? Are you a rebel? You know, my <laughs> I knew somebody would. I knew somebody would be there. All right. So Numbers chapter 20, please. Numbers chapter 20. Numbers chapter 20. I'd also like to tell um, Pastor Betty, thank you so much for allowing me to speak tonight as he is away. It's an honor and a privilege uh, to be able to fill in the pulpit when he is not here. And I uh, don't take that lightly, not whatsoever. And I just want to tell him thank you so much for allowing me to do that as he, away, as he is away. I'm preaching tonight. In Hebrews chapter 20, verse, uh, begin with, excuse me, uh, does that say Hebrews? I'm sorry. Numbers, thank you. Numbers chapter 20. I'm not nervous. It's just you guys. I ain't nervous. It's not, uh. I'm excited. I'm excited, but I'm not nervous. Numbers chapter 20. And we begin uh, reading with verse number 6. And Moses and Aaron went from the presence of the assembly unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, and they fell upon their faces, and the glory of the Lord uh, appeared unto them. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Take the rod, and gather thou the assembly together, thou and Aaron, thy brother, and speak, unto, and speak ye unto the rock before their eyes, and it shall give forth his water. And thou shalt bring forth to them water out of the rock, so thou shalt give the congregation and their beast drink. Um, Brother Mark Clawfelter, would you pray for us, please, sir? Seated. I'm going to keep on reading in verse number 9 if you'd, like, if you'd like to follow along. And Moses took the rod from before the Lord as he commanded him. And Moses and Aaron gathered the congregation together before the rock. And he said unto them, Hear now, ye rebels. Or hear ye now, Wade. Um, hear ye now, ye rebels. Must uh, we fetch your water out of the rock? And Moses lifted up his hand and his, his rod, and he smote the rock twice. And the water came out abundantly, and the congregation drank, and their beast also. And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron, Because ye believed me not to sanctify me in the eyes of the children of Israel, therefore ye shall not bring this congregation into the land which I have given them. This is the water of Merbeba. Mer because the children of Israel strove with the Lord, and he was sanctified in them. So the question comes to, uh, are you a rebel? Or I, let me put it into a different way so, we could, so we're not uh, misunderstood here. Um, does, God, does God see you as a rebel? Does God see you as a rebel? We go back to verse number 10. It says, you know what? Here now, this is what Moses is saying here. Here now, ye rebels, must we fetch you the water out of the rock? And where he was supposed to speak to it, what did he do? He hit it. Took the rod and he hit it, not just once, but twice. So first thing we, we got to see is Moses' mistake. Moses is a mistake. We don't like to say that because we think of Moses, we think of a high and holy man. Of course, I mean, I mean, he's not Christ, he's not Jesus, he's not sinless. Of course, no. We also know, I mean, from the story of Moses, he was a murderer. We know that he killed the Egyptian that was over there. Uh, he was beating up the uh, the Hebrew slave, and he went over there and secretly and killed. Um, that Egyptian, and that's what part of the reason why he took off and, and ran into the wilderness for 40 years before God came to the burning bush or um, talked to him through the burning bush and told him to go and tell Pharaoh, let my people go. So, and of course, we know the story of Moses, and there's one that have great faith in the great story how God could just use. I mean, yes, God can use a murderer. God can use a sinner, and praise the Lord that God can use a sinner. So I'm not trying to belittle him whatsoever, but he didn't make a mistake. We look at his mistake, and uh, let's go back. Um, let's 
read a little bit more, though. All right? Because we see what really happened, what, what got him there, what got him to that point of sin, what got him to that point of a mistake. And we go back to um, Numbers chapter 20, verse number 1. Then came the children of Israel, even the whole con- congregation, into the desert of Zim in the first month. And the people abode in Kadesh, and Miriam died there and was buried there. And there was no water for the congregation, and they gathered themselves together against Moses and against, uh, and against Aaron. And the people showed with Moses and spake, saying, Would God that we have died when our brethren died before the Lord? And why have you brought up this congregation of the Lord into the wilderness, that we and our cattle should die there? Verse number 5. And wherefore have ye made us to come up out of Egypt to bring us into this evil place? It is no place for, of seed or of figs or of vines or of pomegranates. Neither is there any water to drink. And of course this is where we picked up from before where Moses and Aaron went to the Lord, fell on their faces, and the Lord spoke to them and told them what to do. Now, we go back and we see well, there's a lot of things that happened that got Moses to hit the, where he was, where, well, where he got mad and upset and got angry. All right. Number one, we see his sister died. In verse number one, Miriam died. You would think that, you know what, people would, they would understand. I mean, Moses is he's having a hard time right now. He's been going through the wilderness and now his sister has died. All right. And you would think that, you know what, the, the children of Israel would kind of let off this a little bit, just give them a little, a little bit of slack. But no, what, what did they do? Well, they started coming against them, as we see in verse number two, going against Aaron. And they brought themselves against them. And they started murmuring and complaining, as the children of Israel have, have done a lot. We see in verse number four, and they brought the congregation of the Lord. Now, actually, uh, number four, let's start from the beginning of that. And why have ye brought, it's the children of Israel saying, why have ye, Moses, brought up the congregation of the Lord? Oh, they're getting all spiritual now. All right. Why have you brought the congregation of the Lord? All right. And what, how's that finished? Into this wilderness. Now, wait a minute. Wait one second. This has gone back a little bit here, where you know what they, where they sent the spies in, and of course you know the song where you know twelve men went to spy on Cain, and ten were bad, and two were good. All right, and they came and brought the good report of saying, you know what, hey, the land is. Is there for the taking, and of course the ten brought the bad report, saying, "Well, there's giants, and, and there's a lot of people, and there's 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 the walls of Jericho and everything, and uh, we're a little scared." And and got the children of Israel going, "What do we do? What do we do?" Instead of looking to God and having faith in God, all right, they started to doubt, and they started murmuring and complain. And of course they looked to Moses and saying, "You brought us here to die. Why'd you bring us here to die?" All right, and of course what happened? They had to wander in the wilderness for forty years, for forty years. And now it's almost like they forgot that right now, I mean, at this point in time, they are supposed to be in the promised land. That's where they're supposed to be. But they forgot about their murmuring and their complainings and and their lack of faith. And now they're going to look at Moses and go, why have you brought this congregation of the Lord into the wilderness? You know, it's sad to say that we have a lot of people like that. Uh, dare I say church people, but we do have a lot of people who carry their Bibles in, underneath their arms who come to church, and then the moment something bad happens, they're the first ones to walk out the door. I'm reminded of how many times I've seen my dad, for those who don't know, my dad was a pastor of a church in Greensboro for, for many years before um, he got cancer and uh, the Lord took him from us. All right, But as he was ministering as 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 he was preaching all right at, at his church i remember many times many times people and just like how our pastor would do would sit there was stand there at the door and he would shake people's hands and many people would shake his hand and say how wonderful the service was how wonderful the sermon was and how much they appreciate him and how much they love him and then 2 weeks later they were at another church they were at another church 
Now, I know, I know none of y'all here would do that whatsoever. Not none of y'all. Not, absolutely not. I, I'm sure that when you go out there and you shake our pastor's hand and you hold his hand and you grab his hand, you look him in the face and you tell him how much you appreciate him, which all, every single one of us should do. And you tell him what a great job he's doing and what a wonderful sermon it was. You absolutely mean it. And, mean it, and two weeks from now, you're still going to be here at Berean Baptist Church and not the church down the road there. At least that's what I hope and pray will happen. But sadly, we have a lot of people who want to get spiritually minded, who want to think they know better than the pastor. And of course, we've heard our pastor preach on that several many times. And they want to go through and they think they, they know better. They want to be a rebel. They want to be a rebel. Well, you go through it and what happens? Well, we see Moses, he, he's getting angry. His sister died. Now the people are coming over there and complaining and saying, why would you bring us here? Of course, Moses is over going, I... You wasn't supposed to be here. We're supposed to be in the promised land. What else are we seeing? He's saying, you know, bring us here into this evil place. And we see his verse number five. And Moses gets upset. He gets angry. Verse number 10. So here now, here now, ye rebels, must be fetched you water out of the rocks. Now, but I got to hit myself. Excuse me. Excuse me. Now, and all these bad things start to happen. What does Moses do? I mean, all these bad things are starting to happen. All this negativity is starting to happen. And what does Moses do? Well, we see that Moses and Aaron, they, first of all, they went away from the presence of the assembly, of the assembly. In other words, they went away from negativity. And I got to say, that's, that's a good move. All right. They got themselves away from the negative people around, around the negative, well, the, the children of Israel at this time being very much negative. They got themselves away from that. And what did they do? They fell down before the Lord and they started praying. I got to say, that, that, that's good. That's good. I, I, I recommend that. I say that's, what, that's exactly what, when we got people who are trying to tear us down and tear down our ministries and, and talk badly about what the Lord is doing and the work the Lord is doing. Yeah, we just need to get away from that. And then we need to fall down on our faces. We need to ask God to, hey, to pray to us. And what happens after that? The Lord comes and speaks to them. The Lord comes and speaks to them. And tells him, hey, you need water. Okay, I will provide. And praise the Lord. He answers. He hears and answers the prayer. He goes, here, here's the water. Now, somewhere in between that presence with the Lord, praying down, all right, whether it was in the church or the tabernacle at that time, and going to the rock, something happened. So, I guess somebody else came across his way. Somebody else came and, and smiled and shook his hand and said, this has been the best 40 years ever of my life. I praise the Lord for it and how great everything is going. And yeah, no, no, something's, something's quite not right. Something happened in between that time where they had, where, where Moses and Aaron was praying, was falling down, was asking for the Lord's help, where God came and spoke to them and told them what to do and where to go. And the, there, was, there was something boom right there. Something. Now, of course, the Bible doesn't tell us what happened, but clearly something happened. Moses, he just, he lost it. He lost it there. Now, I don't know about you, but um, I kind of agree with Moses. I, if, I, if I may, if I may. I mean, I, I, he's gone through all that negativity. He has gone through all that, that, this, that, that, the death of his sister and, and, and going through where he's known that he was supposed to be in the promised land, but they decided to have the lack of faith and not be in the promised land. And now they're in the wilderness and now they're complaining about not having water. And Moses loses it. Now, I don't know about you. If I may, if I may, if I may be so bold to say, I kind of agree with them. Now, I know you, you may say the exact same thing right there. That, yep, yep, I mean... Where he, he had the right to do that. That's, you know what, that's what we want to say. He had the right to do that. However, this is the thing we got to remember. What did God think about it, though? What did God see about it? I mean, he got away from the negativity. He went over there. He, he went down to pray. He did the right thing. And again, then something happened. And we see that Moses, well, he chose to rebel. When he was over there, when he was saying, hey, ye rebels, all right. Well, the Lord looked at that and said, uh-uh, you're the rebel. You're the rebel. And he went over there and he hit the rock. 
And he said, and then, of course, in verse number 12, I think verse number 12 is one of those things. It says, it really gets you. It really gets you. Because you see the Lord getting on to Moses. And I, I, I'm one of those literal persons. I, I like to put myself in the Bible and say, you know, if I was Moses at this time, or if this is, you know, some point in my life where this is the Lord speaking to me. And the Lord speaking to Moses and, and Aaron, because you believed me not. Because you believed me not. To sanctify me in the eyes of the children of Israel. Therefore, you should not bring the congregation into the land which I have given them. Now, I have in my Bible underlined, you should not bring this congregation into the land which I have given them. And again, this is, again, if I may be so bold to give you a little bit of my thoughts here and a little bit of my sense of humor, I kind of take that as a right. Oh, Lord, you're, I've been doing this for 40 years, and, and now you're going to say, I can't go into the promised land? Yeah, because you know I'm about to, ooh, I'm about to lose it in every single one of them, and you're going to just take them away from me and give somebody else the responsibility, and I'm not going to have to worry about it. And I see what you're doing, Lord, that, absolutely. And it's kind of one of those things, for, uh, if, I, if, I, if I can sum it up in this type of story, there was one time... Um, I don't know about y'all's house, but on Saturdays and sometimes during the week, we have to clean up the house. And me being the adult, all right, of course, I know I'm supposed to be the father and the example and everything, but there's sometimes I don't want to clean the house. I've been working all day or been doing this or all week and everything, and here comes Saturday, a day off, and I don't want to clean the house. So me being me, I kind of start, you know, messing around, horsing around with the um, uh, with the boys, and I start getting them all active and getting them all, you know, excited and everything. And nothing's getting clean except, you know, things are getting broken and things are getting dirtier. And of course, you know, my wife ain't liking that too much. My wife ain't like, and, and she gets that finger out, and we all know, guys, when that finger comes out, we better, ooh, we better, we better stand to attention, or it's going to be our necks. And we go, okay, all right. And then we get told to go into our room. And we're like. To go to my room because that's where I wanted to be at in the first place. So I can go, you know, watch my TV in my room and take a nap and everything. And y'all stay out here and do all the cleaning. Yeah, okay. I I'm okay with that. You know, it, it, sometimes we don't take the Lord very seriously. But God Almighty, I'm not talking about my wife, Lord. No, I'm, excuse me, no. All right. Um, love you, baby. But that's not what I meant by that. There, there's sometimes when the Lord has told us to do something told us to do something, we kind of like, I don't want to do it. And we, in fact, we do the exact opposite of what God has told us to do. And then God comes down and chastens us and he gets on to us. And we're like, it wasn't that big of a deal. It wasn't that big of a deal. I mean, we go back and I, I, I read this and I read over it and I read over it. And every time I read this, I'm on Moses' side. I'm on Moses' side. I'm going, I, I, I mean, again, his sister died. All they're doing is complaining and whining and arguing and everything. They're not helping. I mean, Moses, is, you see in verse number six, him and Aaron are trying to be spiritual and trying to do the right things. They, they went to God. They, they, they bowed down. They asked for help. And they, and, and, and they just, they, you know, I, kind of, I just keep on going back and saying, I agree with Moses. I'm on Moses on this side. All right. And then I started thinking, you know, I've been, a, I've been a coach. I've coached soccer before. I coached basketball. I coached, um, or excuse me, I've done the PE classes and everything like that. And there's a lot of times where you would get certain students who, if I, again, may be so bold, who can't run around the basketball court one time without complaining or whining or arguing about just going around the basketball court one time. And the next thing I know, well, I'm not going to tell you about the phone calls I got. And when the poor, you know, the moms are calling, their dads are calling and saying, my poor baby can't. They're, 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 they're having such a hard time walking around, you know, walking around. They're walking around the basketball goal. I mean, I've told them to run, but they're over there walking around the basketball goal. All right. Anyways, so I'm just like, OK, all right, fine. Because it comes to a point in time and for those who've worked with kids, for those who are parents, you know, there are certain things that I just don't put up with. And the, and the students know this. If you want to get on Mr. Wright's nerves real quick, okay, all you got to do is do, do two things. Number one, huh? this motion right here, huh? 
When I'm over there, I, I explained everything that we're doing. I explained the game. I explained everything. That's, I mean, you take the ball. You dribble the ball. You shoot it in the hoop. That's all you do. And there's so many of them. They're like, huh? What? And then my next favorite thing. I'm so confused. I'm so confused. I, Ms. Teague, you remember, you have some flashbacks there, aren't you? And everything. Yeah, it, it, it's just for some reason. For some reason. Now, you can ask my three boys. They know better. All right? When they're in the kitchen and they do that, for some, somehow they end up in the den. I, they just, you know, because mm, they, uh, those hands, no, th those hands better be right there, right there by your side. Uh uh. And that whole, I'm so confused because you didn't listen. Uh uh. Uh uh. No, no, sir. Absolutely not. I started thinking about that, um, if, if I could use a better terminology, about that brat. I couldn't remember his name. He played on, a, he played on a Duke University, the Duke University's basketball team. All, all my Duke fans, I'm sorry. Uh, I feel sorry for you because, I mean, I don't know why y'all had that guy on there. And I could not remember his name, so I Googled it. The brat player on Duke's team. His name popped right, right up. Grayson Allen. Grayson Allen. Not our wonderful Grayson. Not our wonderful Grayson. No, no. no. Grayson Allen, all right, was his name. For those who don't know, all right, this is a, a few years back, all right, he was a brat. He was a brat. For those who may, who may not know or maybe forgotten everything, he would be playing ba college basketball now. College basketball. And when it was time for his team to go back and um, to play defense or, or something, and they're running by the other team, he would do one of these. Now, we all know that that don't look normal, all right? That's not normal. Uh-uh, no. That's not, 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 not what, what in the world, all right? What he was trying to do was, as they were running back, he was trying to do this to trip players as they were in it. It's on YouTube. You can go look at it. He got, he got called many times for that. That's why also when you go over there and you hit the Google for the, you know, the, the brat player of Duke, this is why his name pops up right there, all right, because that's what he was doing. He was over there trying to trip the other players. And one day, could you believe it, the ref blew his whistle and gave him a technical. And you know what happened? <sighs> All that. I'm so confused. As well as, he started to really show himself, and he had his own little pity party right there, and then, of course, it was on videotape and everything. And it was sad. It was sad. You look at that, and you go, uh-uh. That's not how we need to be. And I started thinking, is that how God sees us when we rebel? Is that how God sees us? When, when, we're, when God tells us to do something, when God has said, this is what I want you to do, all right? And then we go and we do the exact opposite. I mean, no matter how we look at it, no matter how we try to give the excuse, and we love giving the excuses for it. We love giving the excuses for it. But when we start giving excuses, the Lord, He does not see anything but a rebel. He doesn't see anything but a, oh, oh, I'm so confused. And here's the thing. We got to do better than that. As another thing, I started thinking, well, and again, I read back through the scripture and I'm still going, Lord, I, I, I'm still on Moses' side here. I, I still, I don't, I don't get it. I don't get it. And, and then I go over there and, and of course, this is, this is, I don't know, I get, I'll, I'm going to be bold tonight. I'm going to be bold, okay? I flipped over one chapter. You know what happens in chapter 21? The snakes. The snakes. That's when the, 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 children, the children of Israel start to whine and complain, and the Lord sends out the snakes, and then uh, and they're, they're all getting bit and they're dying and everything. And the Lord tells Moses to go and to, and to build the brass serpent and to hold it up. You know, it's supposed to be a, a picture of Christ being crucified and everything. And did I do it? Maybe some of you are thinking the exact same thing. I went, Lord, you sent snakes when the children of Israel were whining and complaining. You allowed the snakes to go over there and, and, and to bite the children of Israel. All Moses did was went, went over and took his rod and he just hit the rock twice. Now, I'm 
I'm just saying, I'm reading your scripture, Lord. I'm reading your word. And I mean, I'm just saying, I mean, Moses got mad. He hit the, um, he hit the rock twice and everything. You call him a rebel. I mean, you, you said you didn't believe me. And then I, I look over in verse number 21, and the children of Israel are doing the exact same thing. And then all of a sudden, you're sending snakes to kill them. I'm just like, well, Lord, what? I'm just, I'm just, I'm just saying. I'm just, I'm just very, you know, humbly, you know, just very humbly. You, you may be thinking the same thing, or you may be ever going, oh my goodness, how dare he ever think that? Well, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm just, I'm just going there, I'm just thinking. And I started thinking about it a little bit more. And of course, the more I started thinking about it, the more I started thinking about it, I'm not changing my mind. And the more I'm thinking about it, the more I'm still on Moses' side. So then I'm, I do my next thing that I do. I act it out. I act it out. I'm a visual person. So I have to see it. So I'm like, okay, so if the Lord gave us a job, or if I gave my son a job, and for example, um, Chad, I'm going to use a microphone stand, but I promise I won't break it. All right. I'm going to put that down so it don't fall. So microphone stand right there. So God tells us, take my jacket, go hang it there on the uh, on the, on the stand. Of course, how many of you seen your kids do this before? What stand? What stand? This stand? That stand? What stand? This stand right here? This stand right here? This, 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 this right here? Right. Have you seen your kids do that before? I guess it's just my three. I mean, pray for me. Uh, sometimes I just do them the slightest, simplest job, and they have no clue whatsoever. And of course, you didn't. You have some of those students or some of those kids who God says, "Take my jacket, put it over there," and they're like, hey, "Do it right there," and all nice and neat and everything, and you're all good. And yeah, mm -hmm. that's kind of like John the Beloved, isn't it? Oh, okay. yeah, he's, yeah, he did good. He did right. He did wonderful. Uh huh. Okay. All right. And then you have the third one. Where God says, take my jacket, put it over there. He takes it. Oh. Uh-huh. I heard it. You saw it. Now, what did Moses do? That's exactly what he did. That's exactly what he did. To the children of Israel. And you, hey, we all heard it. As soon as, and he did it twice. I just did it once. And what happened throughout the whole congregation? Oh. He lost his testimony. He lost his witness right there, didn't he? You saw that. The Lord told him to do something. He got mad. He got angry. And that's what he did. Now, here's the question. Have we ever been that way? Have we ever been that way? Now, if it, I'll, I'll be the first one to say I have. I have. We've gotten angry. We've gotten upset. Was it through a death? Was it through murmuring, complaining? Was it through just things not going right? Absolutely. Absolutely. But here's the thing. We have eyes who are watching us. We have children who are watching us. We have co-workers who are watching us. And the moment, and the devil, he's just waiting for us to have that one split second, that one mistake where we get mad, where we get upset, and just throw it all down. That's what they want. He's just waiting for that. See, that's what God saw. And the moment that I acted that out, and the moment that I saw that, I realized... That's what God saw. That's what made God mad. And that's what God said, okay, enough's enough. We're done. You have to be punished for this. Of all the things that you have done, all the great things you have done, Moses, I, this right here, uh-uh, no, absolutely not. We love to do, like, like I said with the snakes, we love to say, well, God, you did this. You did. Well, here's the thing. He, he is God. He has the power to do that, absolutely. As well as all the people who were murmuring and complaining, if 
Moses just waited a chapter. God was going to take care of them already. He already had a plan to take care of all that. We just have to be patient and just to wait. You know what, Lord? Hey, not my will, not my time, but your time. Your time. As Pastor Betty says, that clock just hates me. It just keeps on getting away. I'd like to move on. And then, and then we have to, and then we have to come up with this, not come up with it, but then we have to admit, he was right, I was wrong. He was right, I was wrong. And we need to understand that there's times where, you know what, the devil just wants us to lose our testimony, to lose our witness, to, hey, just to have that split moment of anger where everybody says, no, it's all right. No, that, that, it's, that, that you it were justified. But yet, look at all the witnesses. I mean, you, you heard the congregation as soon as I hit the, hey, the my jacket hit the ground. That, oh, yeah, we, yeah. We saw that. It turned everything in in a different perspective. There's a lot of times we do not, hey, look at God's perspective on things. We look at everybody else's perspective, but not our, or excuse me, not God's perspective of what he thinks, of what he wants. If I may, in closing, actually, turn with me to um, Numbers 27. Numbers chapter 27. Numbers chapter 27, verse number 14. For ye rebelled against my commandments in the desert of Zim, and the strife of the congregation to sanctify me at the waters before the eyes, and the water of Marbeth in the Kadesh in the wilderness of Zim. So we see back in Numbers 20, verse number 10, Moses got angry. Moses called the children of Israel the rebels, you rebels. And then we turn back to Numbers chapter 27, verse 14, and it reads where God said, For you rebelled. For you rebelled. Where God puts his finger and sticks his finger right in the face of Moses and said, It wasn't the children of Israel that rebelled. It was that you have rebelled. If I can give you this story real quick. There's been times where um, Brother Joseph and Brother Jordan and I have been on visitation and we talk about certain things and we talk about, you know, politics and we, we talk about, you know, budgeting and, and we're talking about saving money and what we're going to do when we get our money and stuff like that. And then we talk about our manly stories. <clears throat> yeah, our manly stories. We talk about war. What would happen if we ever went to war? How would we act? And, you know, I would say, well, I, I never, of course, never had any type of lick of fighting whatsoever. All right, no, no training experience whatsoever. Took a couple classes, you know, took a couple shooting classes and everything. But as of war, no, uh, uh, no, uh, have no idea. But when we start talking about it, we go, well, you know what? I believe, I hope I would be able to stand my ground if we ever had to go into battle. And we kind of agreed on something. We may have, uh, well, I, I, I actually, I'll take that back. I agreed on something. I said something. That, you know what, I, I don't know, but I, I think that maybe, again, I'm being, don't, don't get mad, don't get angry at me, don't, don't be judgmental. I'm just trying to, hey, I'm trying to have a friendly conversation here. So if you're going to judge, you know, be all judgmental towards me and everything, we have an altar and all that. But I, I said to him, you know, I bet if I go into battle, if I go into war, there might be a few times I, I, I say so not, so, not very nice words. I might say not very nice words. I mean, I'm thinking, you know, when bombs start coming and people start shooting at me and everything, that my words may not be very nice. As well as if I'm over there beside my buddy who got shot or got blown up and everything, and I'm over there trying to, you know, stop the bleeding, and I got the blood all over my hands and everything, that I, I might have some not very nice words come to come into my mind. Maybe even come out. Like, I, I don't know. I just, I just, I'm just saying. I, I just, it, it may happen. It may happen. My wife got me a book on George Washington and some of his speeches and his quotes and, and how he um, wanted his soldiers to act. And, he said, and, and one of his phrases says this right here. 
And every officer and man should live and act and becomes a Christian soldier, defending the dearest rights and liberties of his country. It was also said that George Washington wanted no gambling through his soldiers and no profanity. No profanity. Which it kind of hit me. Why would I, in a battle scene like that in war, why would I feel led to say certain things like that? Because I don't have any training. I don't have any training. Somebody who has the proper training and who has the proper commander who has taught them the right way should know better and to be able to, hey, have the ideas. You know, if this is going to happen, I need to have my wits about me. And what does the Bible say? That, you know, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. If anything, I can try to get you to understand or I challenge you tonight about what I'm trying to teach you right now, what the sermon's about, all right, is that where is your mind at? Where is your mind at? And, and for the lack of time, are you a rebel are you obedient? What's the opposite of rebel? Obedient. We turn over there to Philippians. Philippians chapter 2 verse 8. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto the death, even the death of the cross. There's times where, I don't know about you, but as I'm doing my devotions, just coming to the, to, to the top, to the top title. I don't know if your Bible has that. My Bible has that where I have the title of the, of, on, on the I have Philippians chapter 2, and right above that there's a title. And it says, The Attitude of Christ. I didn't have to read anything else after I saw that. It was like a dart just went right there to my heart going, yep. Why is it? That I rebel? Why is it that sometimes I can't control my tongue? Why is it that sometimes I can't control my thoughts? Why is it that sometimes I can't control my actions? Actions Because I do not have the attitude of Christ. I don't have the attitude of Christ. I don't have that rebellious, excuse me, I have the rebellious spirit, not the obedient spirit. I don't have a, as it says in Excuse me, verse number eight. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself. Humble. No, I want to be all prideful. I want to be all about me. That's not how my Christ was. That's not how Christ was. He humbled himself and became obedient. Became obedient. So in other words, when God told him to do something, he obeyed. He didn't rebel. He obeyed. And lastly, going back to Ephesians chapter 6. Follow my brethren, be strong in the Lord, in the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness and of the world, against spiritual wickedness, wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand, therefore, having your loins girt about with the truth, and having your breastplate of righteousness. Putting on that whole armor of God. I don't know about you. But November's coming, and November's coming quick, and I'm a little worried about what's going to happen to our country. And it may, it may be so be it that we may have to stand as obedient Christians, as, hey, Christian soldiers. Now, here's the thing. The world's going to be saying, hey, that's going, they're, going, they're going to translate that, and they're going to interpret that in a totally different way. What am I saying? That we are obedient to God's word. When everybody else is, hey, not going to church, when everybody else is, hey, not reading their Bible, when they turn against God, and as in two weeks later, they're down the road somewhere else, hey, we find ourselves faithful and obedient to God's word. Because, and I hate to say it, but we may have some persecution coming soon here in our country. 
some persecution that we've, we've only heard about from other countries and other stories that may happen right now. So guess what's going to happen? We're going to have, we may get a little angry. We may get a little upset. We may want to do something that, you know what? We may not, we may not need to do. We may want to say something that we don't need to be saying. But we need to have on the whole armor of God. We need to make sure that we're looking to God. His will be done. Because here's the thing where I go and say, I can take care of it. As you see, you know, back in the book of Numbers, he already had a chapter ready to take care of everything. We just had to wait. We just had to be obedient. We just had to follow God and to listen to him. With every head bowed and every eye shut, shut, please. And Ms. Deborah, will you be coming to the piano? And Brother Clayton, getting our invitation song. There are times in life that we are going to fail. There are times in life that we're going to fail. Should that be something that we look at us and we get all whiny and we complain? No, because it just proves the Bible to be true. For all have sinned to come short of the glory of God. When we fail, it just proves the Bible right. For the head bowed, maybe I'll shut everybody stand, please, as we have our invitation time. There may be a rebellious heart. There may be someone who, you know what, you don't, they're, 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 you're angry. You're upset. You're about to make a mistake, just like Moses did. I'm going to ask you. Have you got away from negativity? Did you get yourself away from negativity? Have you found yourself, hey on, hey, on your knees, face down, praying and begging God for His will? And when He gives you His will, and he, when he, what He tells you, when He says, this is what I want you to do, we don't second guess it. We don't rebel against it. We do it. I pray we have the hearts and minds and the attitude of Christ.